So bacteria aren't the only thing that can cause digestive uh, disorders. Not by a long shot. Uh, in fact, of, pretty, uh, of all the body systems, uh, the, uh, the gastrointestinal tract, uh, along with the respiratory, is probably the most vulnerable uh, to non-bacterial uh, pathogens because of its exposure to the world. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, probably second to the respiratory uh, system in terms of how much exposure it gets and full length of uh, mucous membranes. So the, uh, the viruses that I want you guys to know uh, are the various types of hepatitis. Now, are these the only viruses that cause gastrointestinal infections? Absolutely not. There's uh, norovirus, there's um, a whole bunch of other types of viruses, but um, these are uh, a set of viruses that all cause somewhat similar symptoms, uh, but can have very different causes and disease etiologies. So, hepatitis literally means inflammation of the liver. And the viral hepatitises all cause inflammation of the liver. Uh, and they all produce a similar set of symptoms, though they may have a different time frame in which they uh, express them. So, generally speaking, uh, they start relatively asymptomatically. You don't have a lot of pain receptors in the liver, and um, the... Uh, the liver is, you know, in a kind of awkward place uh, for you to notice if there's something wrong with it. So, uh, you know, usually they start off asymptomatically, followed by abdominal pain, usually upper gastric abdominal pain, uh, fatigue, vomiting, loss of appetite... Uh, and jaundice, and jaundice is a key diagnostic symptom. Uh, anytime you get jaundice, what that means is that your liver has effectively stopped functioning or is severely impaired. Um, or it means that you had a massive, uh, like, rupture internal rupture of, of blood um, because your liver uh, processes hemoglobin from your blood cells and uh, that um, that hemoglobin is, is processed into bilirubin uh, and then excreted from your liver through your bile into your intestines out of your body either upping the amount of hemoglobin that it needs to process or slowing down its efficiency at processing things uh, can, um, can cause jaundice. Uh, but most of the cases that are medically relevant have to do with, uh, with liver failure. Um, so the... Five types of viral hepatitis are conveniently named A, B, C, Delta, and E. And Delta is basically D. Um, I don't know why they, they didn't name it hepatitis D virus, uh, but uh, Delta is... Uh, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Uh, so you can diagnose a case of hepatitis, not necessarily the cause of that case of hepatitis, on the basis of symptoms. So observation of jaundice, enlarged liver, and fluid in the abdomen indicates some form of hepatitis. Um, 
bacterial causes of hepatitis are extremely rare. Uh, the liver is simply not exposed to anywhere that bacteria are ever likely to get. So, um, and it contains enough, uh, enough of a white blood cell presence that any bacteria that did get there is, is fairly rapidly wiped out. Uh, this leads to the question of which hepatitis is it? And usually that requires a serotype or antibody-based testing methodology. Sometimes you can make a guess based off of how uh, quickly the disease manifests, how severely it manifests, and what sort of event it manifests after. However, um, all of those are really just guesses. Uh, and so serotyping is the standard way that you determine what type of hepatitis something is. And in fact, most cases of hepatitis are going to be found in like a random serotype screen as opposed to on the basis of uh, diagnosis of symptoms. Um, so prevention is uh, based off of uh, two things, avoidance and vaccines. There are vaccines for hepatitis A and hepatitis B. Uh, hepatitis A and E are uh, both fecal oral. So practicing good food hygiene sanitary practices are uh, key to them. Hepatitis B, C, and Delta are all STIs, sexually transmitted infections, and they are, um, you know, best avoided using safer sex practices. The differences between them. Um, so as you can see, the various hepatitis viruses, they're not necessarily even related. They're all in different families. Uh, some of them are RNA. Some of them are DNA. Uh, some of them are positive sense. Some of them are negative sense. So they aren't necessarily related in any way genetically. They're only related in terms of their symptoms and functionality. Hepatitis A, sometimes called infectious hepatitis, uh, is fecal oral, fecal oral and it's usually um, outbreaks of it are often related to improper food handling at a restaurant or public event. Uh, it uh, usually has a 15 to 45 day incubation period. Uh, causes generally noticeable disease, uh, but not long-lasting. It's acute rather than chronic. And in most cases, uh, it's relatively mild. Um, so it has a fairly low mortality rate uh, and relatively mild symptoms and usually will clear up uh, on its own or with the help of drugs. Uh, hepatitis B is, um, has a long incubation period, so it takes a while before you become infectious with it. It is primarily transferred by uh, sex and by blood contact, particularly sharing drug needles. Hepatitis B is a chronic disease, generally speaking, once you get it, it will be with you for a while. Um, it is sometimes called serum hepatitis, and uh, of the, um, the hepatitises, it is the most severe with mortality rates in the 15 to 25 percent, 
Uh, it should be noted that because this is a chronic ailment, that 15 to 25% might be spread over um, like 20 years, or something like that. And uh, death in this case is usually going to be due to uh, cirrhosis and uh, hepatic cancer. Um, that it isn't necessarily the inflammation that kills you, but the disease um, causes chronic inflammation of the liver, the buildup of scar tissue in the liver, eventually leading towards uh, the development of cancer. Hepatitis C, or Hep C, uh, is also um, sexually transmitted and blood transmitted has a medium uh, incubation time and is usually fairly mild. Uh, it's usually subclinical, meaning that you probably will never notice that you have it uh, unless you have it and another form of hepatitis or you have it and another liver problem. Um, while it will probably never uh, by itself uh, lead to diagnosable symptoms, it probably won't cause jaundice on its own. It probably won't cause uh, a visibly inflamed liver. Uh, it is a chronic disorder, and uh, it just leads to basically chronic damage over time to the liver. Like, even if you don't notice that it's there, because the amount of inflammation is relatively minor, the damage builds up over time, eventually resulting in cirrhosis, scarification, and potentially cancer of the liver. Uh, hepatitis Delta virus, um, sometimes uh, referred to as, uh, I believe, um, hepatitis uh, delta viroid or um, because it actually can't replicate on its own um, so if you have if you get infected with delta you actually can't get infected with delta unless you are also infected with hep b the Delta virus is incapable of, uh, it has mutations in it that make it incapable of replication on its own, but a simultaneous infection of Delta and B will allow the, the enzymes, some of the genes from the B virus to complete the missing steps in Delta. And uh, so you, you can never get infected if that's the only thing that you have, but together, if you have both of these, they can result in a very severe uh, form of hepatitis that can be quite deadly. Um, hepatitis E uh, is another fecal oral route infection, um, typically mild except in pregnant women, uh, whereas in pregnant women it does have a relatively high fatality rate. Uh, there are anti, uh, antiviral drug treatments for, with some efficacy against several of the uh, hepatitis family uh, viruses, um, acyclovir, I believe, uh, a few others. You can go back to the, the anti, um, antimicrobials chapter, and we talked about a few of them back there. All right, helminth infections. Helminths are parasitic worms. Uh, technically, um, uh, they are called infestations rather than infections, but that's really more of a terminology thing than anything else. Uh, most parasitic worms infect the gastrointestinal tract although there are a few that can spread to other places as well. Uh, probably the most common uh, 
helminth infestation in humans is tapeworm. And uh, the tapeworm is a flat, segmented, parasitic worm. Uh, they can grow extremely long, uh, several times the linear length of the intestinal tract. Uh, they lack their own digestive system, so they wait for you to digest food, and then they just absorb it. Um, and their uh, head, or scolex, uh, has little hooks that they can use to uh, embed themselves into your intestinal lining, uh, as well as like little suckers to stick on. Um, infestation with a tapeworm is at first relatively asymptomatic. So um, if the tapeworm continues to grow and uh, grow they can, then it will eventually cause bloating, uh, extreme intestinal pain, and uh, uh and basically lack of ability to thrive, like you'll eat a lot, but you won't gain any weight, and you will become malnourished. Uh, so abdominal pain, nausea, weight loss, and diarrhea. Uh, Tinea saginata is beef tapeworm. Tinea solium is pork tapeworm. Um, of them, pork tapeworm is more commonly encountered. And uh, the pork tapeworm eggs can embed themselves into pork meat, into the, the muscle of the pig, uh, which you can then ingest. Now, this is one of the reasons why you generally don't see rare pork products. Uh, and um, so you should always consume your pork well cooked. Uh, because tapeworm eggs are fairly hardy uh, and do require a, a moderate amount of heat to kill them. Uh, the tapeworm will grow inside of your intestines and shed eggs. Uh, those eggs come out fecally into uh, the soil where they usually get uh, picked up by an intermediate host and then get back into whatever system they usually come into. So uh, they're probably going to get picked up by something in the soil and then um, passed from there into a pig, or at least that's the way it hopes to work. Um, so incidents. Uh, Wormy infestations of any kind are relatively rare in the United States. In fact, they're extremely rare in the United States. Um, a normal state, like, will probably get, depending upon the size of the state, uh, anywhere from, like, maybe one case a year to perhaps a couple of dozen cases a year in places depending upon the population and the sort of food culture of the state. Uh, but that's all very fairly low incidence. Uh, tapeworms have fairly high incidence in uh, developing countries and any place with poor sewage treatment or places where humans live in close contact with livestock on a daily basis. Um, in Europe, there's a kind of medium incidence where it's like, uh, you know, not super uncommon, but not common either. It's like more common than you would find here, but not as high an incidence level as, uh, uh as, as you'll find in you know, a developing country. Diagnosis is usually on the basis of finding like little pieces, little segments of the worm in the feces. Like you 
you poop and a little bit of worm comes out and you go, Jesus Christ, what the hell is that? Uh, and you go talk to a doctor. Um, those are the proglottids, by the way. Uh, the treatment. Uh, there's basically a couple of different ways to treat it. Uh, the old way, which is still the safer way, is you, um, you don't eat for a few days, and then, uh, the worm gets very hungry, and then you take this sort of salty bait, basically, and you put it near one end or the other of your elementary canal, and it'll kind of, like, crawl out and try to get at the bait, right? So it'll, like, poke its head out, um, and then you grab it and very carefully pull it Slowly, slowly pull it out the end. Um, and uh, you don't want it to snap in half because they're like, you know, with, with earthworms, if you cut them in half, they usually die. Like, that's an old rumor. But with tapeworms, if you cut them in half, they will survive often. And uh, so if it breaks in half, then... That half of the earthworm left, in, or the half of the the tapeworm left inside of you, uh, will probably regenerate. So the other, these days more common method is to treat with drugs, usually niclosamide, and not going to try to pronounce that. Um, and uh, they are relatively low therapeutic index drugs. Like, they can be pretty nasty to be on for any length of time, um, but they will kill the, uh, the worm pretty well. Prevention uh, largely is on thorough cooking of meats, uh, particularly pork, as I said, though there are also tapeworms that spread through uncooked fish, and so it's very important that if you are making sushi... Um, you get sushi quality meat uh, because poor or sushi quality fish, I should say, uh, because low quality fish can lead to tapeworm. And this is just a life cycle of the tapeworm. Uh, protozoal. So there are a couple of protozoal diseases out there uh, that infect the intestines. In fact, most protozoal diseases that can infect humans do infect the intestines, and they get in through a fecal-oral route. Uh, one of the most common in the United States, in fact, that is the most common in the United States, is Giardia, uh, which uh, the full organism name is called Giardia lamblia. And it causes giardiasis. Uh, the protozoans usually uh, go between what's called a, uh, a, a trophozoite and a um, an assist state. Uh, and the trophozoa is the active growing state, and the cyst is basically like, it's kind of an egg, but not quite. It's an inactive state, and the cyst is hardened and difficult to kill. And this is common for many protozoal um, diseases. Oops. Uh, Giardia is sometimes called hiker's diarrhea. It's usually contracted um, from natural lakes and streams. Uh, and the signs and symptoms, it's often asymptomatic. Uh, and when it does produce symptoms, the, the symptoms are typically a watery diarrhea uh, and... Uh, 
usually though not always without bleeding. Um, and it can be a diarrhea that lasts for up to four weeks and positive diagnosis is made by observing live Giardia trophozoites in a fecal sample. And um, Giardia is pretty easy to identify. Uh, it's got a, an interesting shape. It looks sort of like this little, I don't know. It's got two nuclei up here, the little dot in them. And it's got this thingy inside of it that's kind of bent right there. And then it will usually have several flagella coming down off one side. So it looks like this little happy smiley ghost monster thing. Uh, pretty easy to identify when you see it. Um, so uh, basically it, it doesn't usually get into the cells from the intestines but it uh, flaps around on the mucosal lining of the intestines, irritating them and causing them to release liquid. Uh, so the usual way that you get infected is uh, through drinking infected water uh, or otherwise imbibing infected water uh, with the water contaminated with cysts and it comes out in the feces, so it's a fecal oral disease. Uh, the cysts themselves are um, resistant to mild disinfectants, so alcohols and particularly um, halogens like chlorine and iodine uh, don't necessarily kill the cysts. So Giardia is also known to spread through swimming pools, like public swimming pools. You can have Lots of uh, kids using it or something like that causes diarrhea. Some of them are going to poop in the water, you know. Swimming pools got poop in them. Uh, public ones do. And um, the chlorine in the swimming pool that usually keeps them relatively uh, disinfected won't necessarily kill the Giardia cysts. And so other people in the pool can get it. And that's another way that they are known to spread. Uh... So yeah, uh, observation of Giardia in the stool is how it's diagnosed. It's treated uh, with metronidazole or uh, furazolidone. And sometimes treatment is actually not necessary. Sometimes it'll go out on its own um, and you just need rehydration and bed rest. But it can last up to four weeks. So most of us don't really want to be on rehydration and bed, bed rest for that long. And here you can see this is a this is a giardia here. And here you can see are those flagella coming down. Um, this is the sucker surface. This is the dorsal surface, and it'll just like stick to your intestines and uh, cause irritation. All right, so that is the non-bacterial uh, intestinal disorders that I want you guys to know.